Hi, Jen. How are you? Hi, David. Hello, everybody. Good Hello. Hi. Good morning to you, David, actually, I should say. And uh, we're about to get started in just a second. I just want confirmation from Megan that we are recording the session. Uh, Megan McMahon, do you mind confirming? Confirmed. Confirmed. Okay. Well, thanks a lot. David, uh, Jen, if you're ready, we can get started. Uh, just a quick few words of introduction. So this is our second session of our Activity Strong Winter Gathering. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you for the ones that participated in our first session. It was great. It was interactive. Um, my name is Charles de I'm the CEO and co-founder of Linked Senior. And uh, a little bit about my bio. I, I believe all people are cool and our industry is Activity Strong. These are two uh, quote-unquote pillars of what Link Senior likes to promote. So All People Accord is an initiative we launched seven years ago to fight ageism, so this idea of segregation based on age, but in a fun, interesting way to lead healthy conversation about the fact that in the end, we are all cool, including elders. And uh, Activity Strong is this platform that we initiated at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic as a way to acknowledge, empower, and educate activity and life enrichment professionals. And so this introduction is going to be rather short, but I do want to share that we do this in partnership with Activity Connection, NAP, and NCAP as a way to lead and advance and continue to innovate the field of resident engagement. In terms of quick housekeeping elements, I'd like us to uh, I'd like to remind all of us that we can earn up to three NAB, NCAP, NCTRC, and or NCCDPCU. To earn these credits, you need to attend the full session. So as few as one session, you could come for David and Jen's session, and and uh, hopefully you'll stay on. But if you want to only have one, you can only one. You're gonna have only one but you can earn up to three sessions today. To get the CEUs, you need to fill in the, CEUs, the CEU survey no later than midnight on Friday, December 10th, so that we can process the certificate. And again, we'll issue up to three hours of CEUs. Uh, please note that due the, to the large number of attendees, the certificates will be sent out by email throughout the week of December 13th and no later than December 17th. If you have any questions, I want to point out to the fact that we have a new email to manage all this process, and it's webinars <coughs> with an S, webinars at linksenior.com. As a reminder, today's session is being recorded. Also, uh, just so you know, I'm sure that all of us is very familiar with what Zoom is about these days. Um, some of us might be Zoomed out, but Zoom has two feature uh, to interact with the speakers and the audience. Uh, one of them is the chat, the other one is the Q&A. Um, the, the, the chat gets very busy, so if you have something specific for our uh, presenters, please have it in the Q&A. And then last but not least, because the conversation is amazing and we want, we love the conversation, please make sure that you select everyone in the uh, chat uh, drop-down to make sure that everybody sees your comment um, because by default, it is for our panelists and attendees. And last but not least, uh, two comments which are really important to us and me especially. Please have fun today. Have fun with the audience. Have fun with our speakers. They have amazing presentations. And um, also, as a reminder, we have this happy hour at the end of the, um, of the uh, gathering. And then last but not least, thank you for what you do every single day. Thank you for showing up at work and helping our elders find purpose every day. We all believe, and obviously our speakers believe that as well, we all believe that the work that you do is beyond essential. So thank you for doing this. It's an immense pleasure for me to introduce you all to two amazing leaders in the field of resident engagement, Dr. Jennifer Stelter and David Troxell. And they're going to take us through uh, today's second session called Planning Dementia Care with Purpose. And at this point, I will stop sharing. Thank you again for uh, joining us, David and Jen. 
Uh, please take it away. All right. Thank you so much. I just wanted to say thank you to Lika and Megan for a wonderful presentation. I hope that we can complement what you were talking about in this presentation. You know, again, we, you know, to mimic what Lika had said, you know, we are not um, engagement leaders or we are not, um, you know, statisticians, we're not uh, researchers per se in our field, but we can use data to really drive the purpose of what we do every day in terms of planning our dementia care. So we're gonna hop right in. Um, can everyone, can, uh, Charles, can I just wanna do a screen check to make sure that everyone can see my screen? Yeah, I think we just want you to, um, uh, yeah, to, sorry, I'm losing my, my English, uh, to do a full screen. So at the bottom right, uh, you can select full screen. Yeah, there you are. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. All right. So let's go ahead and dive in a little about myself. Um, I am the director of product research at Link Senior, and I'm also the um, chief engagement officer of the Resident Engagement Institute that was powered by Link Senior here earlier this year. Um, I also have my own company called NeuroEssence, where we focus on uh, the non-pharmacological approaches to care uh, in dementia. I'm also the creator of the, the Dementia Connection model. This is a brand new model launched in the field actually October, uh, so just a couple of months ago. And I'm also an educator, an educator and dementia program designer. Um, and with that said, I'm gonna have David kind of take over and introduce himself. Well, hello everybody, I'm David Troxell. It's great to be with you, Jennifer. I live in Sacramento, California, but I'm actually in Southern Illinois today at a community here and in the very frigid uh, Illinois right now with I guess like 17 degrees. So uh, happy to be with you all and maybe add a bit of sunshine to your day with our work together. Uh, I've worked in the field of Alzheimer's disease and dementia care well over 25 years, began my career at the University of Kentucky Alzheimer's Research Center. I'm known for the development of the best friends approach to Alzheimer's care, which is very focused on activities and engagement with my dear friend and my colleague, uh, Virginia Bell, being a co-creator. I'm a writer. I also work as a program consultant in dementia care and educator. And like I'm sure so many people in this webinar today, I've also been a family member, a family care partner for my mother, Dorothy, who passed away with Alzheimer's disease and actually lived in memory care for three years in 2008 and currently for my mother-in-law who lives in assisted living in Sacramento and also has uh, uh, issues around dementia. So good to be with you. I hope we can give you a lot of great ideas. You'll hear Jennifer and I both talk about this, but you know, we think you are the most important people when it comes to dementia care in so many ways. Socialization is the treatment for dementia. And we wanna thank you right up front as Charles did for all the great work you're doing. So with that, Jennifer, I'll toss it over to you to kick us off on our webinar today. Sounds good, thank you so much, David. So we have uh, a few objectives today that we'd like to cover with you. Uh, one, to learn why a social prescription model through the use of API, and we'll get into that, can be effective in dementia care. Um, and when we talk about this API process and the use of social prescription, this is actually can be used with any population, but we're gonna talk more specifically, how do you do it in dementia care? We're also gonna identify the best practice areas that should be considered in planning the phase of care for those with dementia. Now we understand that you, we're still in the middle of a pandemic. And so we're not expecting you to start tomorrow and say, how can I really implement all of these initiatives when it comes to planning uh, the programs? But maybe take away one thing from this or one tip or practice area from this uh, uh, webinar today that you can start to implement. And how I want you to look at it is, uh, many of you are familiar with the QAPI process, right? The quality assurance performance improvement process. And so maybe taking one of these areas from this presentation today and using it as your QAPI for the month or the quarter, how often you do that with your administrator, and then putting that into practice, you know, in order to see the results of this. Again, we're engagement leaders, we're not statisticians, we're not data researchers, but that's okay. Because with that said, you can just take the information that we are giving to you that have been shown to be clinically or to be effective in um, evidence-based research 
that you can feel good about implementing and say, okay, how am I going to do this through a QAPI? The third thing we're going to do is we're going to put that pertinent information into an effective plan that will provide meaningful engagement and connections uh, leading to better clinical outcomes and quality of life. And then we're going to focus a little bit on the best friends approach from David. He's going to talk a little about his model and how to implement those within activities. So really excited about that. We always love our seniors. We always have to give tribute to them because this is who we serve every day. So David, thank you for sharing that photo with us. So let's talk about the standard practice of API. Um, if you've been on other webinars that I've done for Link Senior, as well as has been in, you've been involved with some of the uh, recent um, surveys that we've done. We've also, we'll talk a little about the, uh, or a lot about the elder engagement performance improvement tool, the EPI tool. We strive to talk a lot about API. API is a standard practice model that really all um, healthcare providers in the industry use as a, a kind of a blueprint to how they provide treatment. Essentially, it stands uh, for the assess, plan, implement, and evaluate components, right? So when we pull data, again, these are just answers from your assessments. Those help us to create the plan, or some of you may be familiar with the word care plan or plan of care. That plan is then carried out by the team and implemented and tracked, right? When you're implementing that, that means you're providing the programming and you might be tracking attendance, participation level, satisfaction level, so on and so forth. And after you implement the plan, it's really key to evaluate how that plan is working for each individual person, as each person has their own plan, as you know. So we want to evaluate, is this plan working? Is it not working? So on and so forth. And from there, the team can adjust the plan. So let's hop into a little more specifics. When we talk about using API as a structure for so social prescription, now, uh, Charles talks a lot about this and in, in the industry is really moving in this direction and we hope as an organization to support this initiative to really make social prescription the, the must to go to in order to drive really good quality treatment. The idea behind social prescription is that we want to create a person centered system where psychosocial preference is just as important and as any clinical or medical prescription. Uh, for the elderly, and that it's really the first course of action for um, intervening, for engagement. Uh, when we talk about clinical treatment, instead of using medication as that first line of defense, I think we can all agree that psychotropic medications, specifically those are medications that help treat mood and ultimately some kind of behavioral expressions that are more negative or maladaptive in nature in some fashion, that sometimes medication is just overused and we need to come up with a better solution. Um, a, because we know it's better for our, our residents' overall health. B, we know families really want it. They want to be able to have other options besides medication for their loved ones with dementia. And C, CMS requires it. They require a non-pharmacological approach before using medication. So we are instituting here at Link Senior, as well as a driver through the Resident Engagement Institute is this social prescription uh, method, right? And the API process supports this. So if you follow API, you can be successful with social prescription. So here's just a little bit of a diagram to kind of bring this to life a little bit, right? In the assessment phase, you might have a life story assessment or some other assessment that you conduct on a regular basis with residents. From there, you develop that prescriptive engagement plan, which we're gonna talk about here a little bit. Then you're gonna implement that through your programming and through your engagement. And what I say by engagement is that I think we all know and agree that programming needs to happen outside of just activities or what's on the calendar. Whether I'm a CNA or I'm a nurse or a, a dietary aide, I can engage with my resident just as powerfully as I can my activity staff. And so we really want that engagement piece included in the implementation process. And then evaluate, you wanna look at that data Again, you don't have to wear a statistician hat or be a researcher to do this. As an engagement leader, you can. You can look at that data and review it. And so it's simply, it's just, it's an intentional process that you're working through every day. So Megan's gonna go ahead and pop up a poll here for you. 
we want to get a better understanding of, of your familiarity with API. So if you can answer correctly here, um, or to the best of your ability, what's the status of your API? So you've not heard of API before, you've heard of it, but you don't know much about it, you know about it, but you don't use it, or you know about it and use it when planning programming. And we're going to go ahead and look at the results here in a couple of slides. So thank you, Megan, for popping that up. I appreciate it. OK. So we went ahead and we developed a tool called the Elder Engagement Performance Improvement Tool, or EPI tool, as I mentioned earlier. It's actually a second version of the RICE tool, if you're familiar with that. We had that last year. So this actually was launched in September of this year and carried through through November. The objective really for this was to measure the effectiveness of your organization's processes in assessing, planning, implementing, and evaluating resident engagement. So how well is your organization familiar with and using the API process in order to set yourself up for success in developing great clinical outcomes? We had an, an, an enormous response, which was great. We had 185 plus submissions, which was wonderful. And here are the findings when you break it down in just the categories of API. So if you look at the grade findings, we had a little over about 65% as a grade, right? So you think about grades like, um, you know, 60 to 70% is that D range, right? 70 to 80 is that C range, 80 to 90 is B range and so on, right? So we're at a 65% as uh, for those who had submitted their responses, we're at a 65% grade level for assess. So I think we can all agree that we need to do better. Planning was a little bit shorter than that. So planning, we had um, a little bit less than 65%. Implement was at 50% and evaluate was at 35%. So you can see here is as we work through the API process that there is a underperformance of the follow through when it comes to the full treatment model that most healthcare professionals use, right? And so with that said, we wanna improve these processes by looking at each area of API and how we can boost our productivity in those areas. Now, the interesting part too is one question we had on the EPI tool was, do organizations look at their residents' clinical outcomes? And unfortunately, only 28% said that they do. And that's really alarming because as we're implementing our plans, we need to know if it's effective. So if we don't evaluate their clinical outcomes, we don't know if what we're doing is actually working. And Lika kind of mentioned this. She said, stories are great. They are great. They're fantastic. Um, pictures of the things that they've done are even better because you get to see their smiling faces. But we do need data in order to prove that what we're doing is actually working. So the conclusion of the EPI uh, tool was that, you know, when we gather data and we set up the plans that we, we do about an average uh, job at doing that, but the reevaluation process and trying to look back at what's working, what's not working, understanding our residents' pathway to health, that really needs improvement. Now, the interesting part though, we had a question on there related to do activity professionals seek out evidence-based research to help plan their programs? And 77% do, that's fantastic. You know, and so with that said, we know that individuals like yourselves, you crave uh, tools and objectives and approaches like this, like the API process, but maybe it's just that you've not been introduced to something like API or have not been educated on it. So with that said, Megan, can you give us the results for the poll question that we had? All right, so about 42% have not heard of API before. 22% have heard of it, but do not know much about it. 13% know about it, but don't use it. And 23% know about it uh, and use it during the planning process. So I think there needs to be more education out there about what API is, how to use it effectively, and hopefully a presentation like today will help you do that. So today we're gonna to primarily focus on the planning component. So, and that's what we want to go through entirely with the webinar. So the idea about planning uh, for dementia care engagement, uh, one is to take that assessment information and determine an individual person-centered prescriptive, which we'll talk about, or recommended engagement plan. 
the goals here really are you, you see, um, you know, are we meeting the goals that will assist the resident in minimizing their symptoms, supporting them on their journey, and, and helping uh, to minimize their challenging behavioral expressions. Um, the goal also is to help provide programming to meet their needs and preferences in a constructive, meaningful way to ensure satisfaction and to, of course, help improve or to impact better clinical outcomes. Now, the table that I have there are just areas that we would want to consider as areas to assess. And more particularly, some of these areas are going to help us to pull information to learn more about the uh, resident, number one. But two, more importantly, how to drive that prescriptive plan, which I'll talk about here in a second. So this is really a holistic approach to care. And CMS in the last year has really been focusing a lot more on this holistic component. Um, about probably seven, eight years ago, um, they really more prominently want to focus on the psychosocial aspect of the resident. And then in the last year, they've um, enhanced, if you're in skilled nursing, they've enhanced more of the MDS items to focus on even more areas that weren't in, included in the MDS before. So with that said, we want to, of course, follow the lead of a CMS, but more importantly, this gives us an overall picture of all parts of the person to really get to know them. Now, the result when we're doing the planning component is we'll be able to plan out how long the resident should be engaged each day, what is shown in clinical research, which programs can be most beneficial to the resident, groups, one-on-ones, and so on. What engagement uh, is, should we provide based on their preference uh, to ensure that they are the engagement is meaningful and satisfactory? And which residents have the same interest to assist in grouping them together? So when you're creating that calendar uh, for your small and large groups, which residents have the same interests? Um, a program like Link Senior, Salo Context, are able to pull those reports really easily for you so you don't have to do all that legwork. I know some of you may still be keeping manual lists that maybe you have on Word or maybe Excel, but there are programs out there like Link Senior that can help you do that. That's a much more efficient process. And before you know it, your programs will be planned and then you can implement them, which is really easy. So let's talk about the best practice areas when it comes to planning out your programming. Again, you can use these specifically with dementia. We'll go into some specific areas to look at for dementia care, but this can also be used for any population that you're treating. The first thing you would want to look at is this concept of minutes per resident per day. And if you've been on previous webinars, you will know that we've talked about MRD. And it's really, it's how many meaningful minutes should, be, should each resident be engaged to produce quality outcomes based on level of functioning. So I'm going to go into more detail on that. The second one is programming recommendations. So, you know, is there a preference for one-on-ones versus groups? Both, again, based on level of functioning, we'll go into depth about that. And last but not least, preferences, incorporating their preferences into their programming to increase how meaningful and satisfactory that engagement actually is. And so we'll talk more about that as well. So when we talk about, let's start with MRD. So I had done a literature review of a number of areas that have been shown in clinical research around the use of how much should a person be engaged, uh, an you know, an aging senior, in order to have that engagement be profound for all the holistic areas I had mentioned for cognition, for physical health, for mental health, so on and so forth, right? So I actually did, I looked at our Link Senior communities who have Link Senior. I looked at their data pre-pandemic and the average came out to 35.09 MRD. So meaning that the Link Senior communities are engaging their residents about 35 minutes a day, each resident. Uh, then a uh, follow-up on that RICE study that I had mentioned earlier, which was the first version of the EPI tool, um, it showed that individuals are engaging their residents about 45 minutes per day. And then I looked at the leading research with regards to, there's a lot of research on um, how much physical activity should seniors get, how much cognitive activity should seniors get as, we, as they age, and that came out to about 30 minutes of MRD. So when you average out this literature or this lit search that I did, it comes out to about 36.70 MRD. So we at Link Senior, um, and then driven by resident, the Resident Engagement Institute, we are proposing 35 minutes of meaningful engagement for each resident each day. 
Now we're going to talk about this scaled down version based on level of functioning here in a second. But what I want to say about this 35 minutes is, you know, we're taking clinical evidence from the research and we're saying this is what's being proposed. So let's try it. Let's set a benchmark for ourselves of how much should we engage our residents each day to show that they can age in a healthful way, no matter of their diagnoses. Now, we do know there's going to be complicating factors due to diagnoses, but with that said, it shouldn't diminish the, the engagement minutes, right? But what we're going to talk about is this level of functioning that may scale it down a bit so that we can be more realistic with individuals. So when we talk about level of functioning, most people in the industry are very familiar with the low, moderate, high. And so CMS drives this initiative really about, you know, we need to be evaluating our residents for functioning level. And that evaluation process is kind of twofold. It comes from not only yourself in, in your assessment, but um, there might be data that is helpful from your social worker, from your nursing department, so on and so forth, to be able to, you know, fully determine this. And then you have that same subset in dementia. So individuals who are diagnosed with dementia, they can be broken up into low, moderate, high groups as well. And so when we talk about um, the scaled down version of MRD, we're proposing that based on level of functioning, um, you are going to engage that resident by that number of minutes. Now, we're not saying that's the end all be all. You know your residents the best. So what's important here is that you determine, okay, my resident, let's say is moderate dementia and it says to engage her for or him for 14 minutes per day. But my resident with dementia is very active. So I'm gonna attempt the 21 minutes a day and that's fine. As long as you can explain, you know, why you're doing the MRD at the level that you are, that's what's important, right? It's important that, and the second thing that's important is that you are giving yourself a benchmark for that particular resident and you're seeing if it works. And we'll talk about here in a second, how do you know if it works? Um, but that's important to, to kind of set that benchmark for each resident. Now we did a, um, one of the questions or two of the questions on the EPI tool was, do you use level of functioning when planning your individual and group programs? And uh, we talked about how much of time, you know, uh, how much of the time do you do this? And there was a lot that said always, they always consider level of functioning when planning program and about 60% do that for both individual and group sessions. Um, about 75% um, of the time people, that was about 40% of individuals do it about 75% of the time. A little less than 40% um, of individuals do it 50% of the time and so on and so forth. You can kind of see that. So what's telling here though, is that not everyone all the time uses level of functioning, which we need to be more mindful of. The second uh, best practice area that I wanna go into is talking about types of programs that are being offered. Now we're very familiar with the group activities, both small and large. We do know that individuals with dementia do better in mostly small group activities. However, there might be times where they can uh, prevail in large group activities as well. Um, and then we have our one-on-one -on -one activities and I'm gonna have David talk a little bit about his 30-second activities. Well, you know, certainly one of the things, Jennifer, that I hear staff talk about all the time is I don't have time, I don't have time, I don't have time. And I, I totally understand we are in a historic uh, uh, staffing crisis. But one of the things that I think you're picking up already from Jennifer's excellent presentation is just how every minute counts to me, every minute counts. And so one of the things I've written about in the best friends books and our activity books, and just in general, is how much you can do with a minute here, a minute there. And we kind of have a, a fun handout that we share with you in the, in the chat box, about 30 things to do in 30 seconds or less. If you have a, a, a residential care community with let's say 16 residents and all of the staff are admiring the color of someone's sweater, uh, talking about their goatee, talking about them winning a, a, an award for the nurse of the year, looking at birds outside the window, uh, giving a welcome hand massage. There's so many great things you can do. And so the handout that we shared with you sometime during the presentation as a, a little link is something my co-author Virginia Bell and I wrote about 30 things to do in 30 seconds or less during COVID about how we can still make these important moments of engagement. Thanks, Jennifer. Thank you, David, I appreciate that. And also to uh, share in his sentiment is if you're playing with life skills stations, now some individuals might count this as self-directed if the resident can engage with themselves in that life skill station, 
or you might count it as a one-to-one -one if an activity professional is working with that individual or maybe another. It's a great time for CNAs to get involved, dietary professionals, so on and so forth, right? Again, going outside the scope of our department. Um, if you're not familiar with life skill stations, it's actually recreating and knowing what the resident did for a living or what their roles were that they identified with and be able to recreate that within the neighborhood that they live in. So, for example, if an individual maybe I actually had a patient who was a stenographer for the court system and interesting story, we found that when she would um, be uh, wheeled into the dining room and she would uh, be at her dining room table. Before she was served her food, there was a lot of kind of uh, clicking, bopping onto the table often. And uh, the staff were like, why does she do that? Um, and unfortunately, a lot of the other table mates were uh, getting frustrated with her when she would do that. Um, and so we, we dived in, of course, to her life story, and we understood that she's a stenographer for the court system. And so what we did in order to preserve the dining process was we made sure that her food was served at that time when she was brought to the dining room. So that way she could remember that it's time to eat, it's not time to work, right? Uh, Cause she associated the table with working. And then we created a little office area with a typewriter where she could go to that area and she could type away and she would spend so much time doing it and she was so happy doing it. And so those are great ways, especially during this time to create those life skills life skill stations that don't take a lot of staff time to do it, because once you initiate and get the residents started, they often can carry it on themselves, which is wonderful. So when we talk about programs, you have to think to yourself, how many times a week for each, uh, you know, whether it's one-on-ones, whether it's small groups, large, large groups are based on level of functioning, right? What is preferred, what's tolerated, and how many groups uh, would they go to um, based on if they're in one-on-ones. And so let me show you kind of what I'm talking about here. So I bring up this table again about programming recommendations. So if you have a resident, let's say, who's high functioning, uh, the MRD that would be scaled down would be 21 minutes per day. And this uh, program recommendations might be some one-on-ones three days a week and some large group activities. And again, these are just guides, right? So if you think about this combination, put yourself in your resident's shoes and say, what am I doing every day? Am I being touched by someone every day in some respects, right? Um, and so with that, when if, if this individual goes to large group activities or maybe even small group activities on a daily basis, then perhaps the number of minutes that are not covered in group can be covered in one-on-ones. Now, if they go to less groups, like let's say the individual maybe who has um, low functioning um, low functioning dementia more in their later stages maybe they they don't go to groups they don't prefer it or perhaps it's just not appropriate for their physical stamina at this time so we're going to want to meet with them every single day twice a day um, in order for them to feel that meaningful engagement right so with that said you want to compare how many groups are they going to per week that will help you determine how many one-on-ones per week that you would want to supplement with that in order for them to be touched once or twice a day, if, you know, at minimum. The third area I wanna talk about is this preference-based programming. And so this is the next best practice area. Um, so when we talk about preferences, I know we, it's a word that we always use in our field. We know we need to uphold preferences, but why is it important? It really fosters engagement and improves quality of life and well-being uh, by living every day in a way that is meaningful and purposeful. Um, when the person identifies with what you're doing with them, they're more likely to go along with it because they like it, they enjoy it. They're going to associate that positive interaction with you. And we know in dementia care, and you may have heard this before, that you know. The person doesn't really care what your title is. They probably don't even remember your name. But what matters is how they feel with you. So the more that you can make the engagement, again, whether an activity professional, you're a CNA, you're a nurse, the more that you can uh, have that meaningful engagement with that person because they identify with what they're doing and they like it, what they're doing with you, they're going to associate you as the positive experience as well. And so the more that you foster that engagement together, they're more likely going, it's gonna spill over into other things, right? 
they're more likely going to go along with ADL care. They're more, more likely going to um, you know, work with you on anything that you're asking them to do or that they need to do, so on and so forth. They're gonna associate that positive experience with you. The other thing too is that it does enhance the autonomy and ability uh, to have a voice in direct care services. So families can share what they think is appropriate for their loved one based on what they know. If the individual can still voice their preferences, then they you know, have some control in that respect. Um, but it also, because they identify it with, you know, they identify with the preference more, and maybe they've done it a lot in their life, all we have to do is kind of just, it's like riding a bicycle, right? They're going down, they're riding their bicycle, and then let's say that they fall off, right? They get back on, they keep riding that bicycle. Even though maybe they haven't ridden that bicycle in a long time, they brush, you know, brush off the cobwebs, if you will, and they get right back on and they can ride as if they've been riding the whole time. So it provides that autonomy that they could probably step in and do a lot of this on their own if they're given the resources and the support. It also creates a care environment of trust and respect. You know, if they know or if their family knows that you are taking their preferences into account, then they can trust you that you really care about them individually, right? And then that builds that respect back and forth. The idea here is that the more you can give control to the resident or to the family members, they're gonna feel much more part of the planning process than if they aren't included in that. It also can improve satisfaction ratings. If they love what they're doing, I mean, you can't argue with that, right? It can also help prevent uh, you can also use it as prevention and inter intervention approaches. So when you know that residence and you know this works for them, when maybe uh, you, let's say for sundowning, let's say, sundowning usually happens late afternoon, early evening. Let's say you have a resident who typically sundowns and sundowns maybe um, more than other residents. And you know that she loves to, I'm gonna use uh, Leica's uh, activity of, of watercolor, she loves to do that, then ideally you want to start that about 30 minutes prior to the sundowning process. So she's engaged in something she loves to do. And likely what will happen is she will move through that sundown process without even having any of those behavioral expressions because she's engaged in she loves to do. We're being preventative by planning it out. So that way the individual is, is engaged in that and not, uh, you know, there's no none of this anxiety that's being created, or this fear that's being created, this um, irritability that's being created, you know, which is typically the kind of underlying issues related to sundowning. But it can also use it as an intervention too. So if the individual does have negative behavioral expressions, then using some of these preferences that they like to do, we know it's a go-to, we know they're gonna like to do it and you try that with them as well to help calm them down and feel at peace, right? It can also promote closer relationships with care team members because if the care team members like, you know, we always talk about as activity professionals, we want help from other departments, right? We want help from our CNAs, we want help from our nurses. If they're given the information that they know to be successful with the residents, they're more likely gonna help us. Like if they know, you know, Susie Q who always sundowns, let's say at 4.30, um, if they know things that they can do with her to help calm that process, they're more likely going to want to do it because they feel more confident and competent at what they're doing. And of course, we do know that preferences are required by CMS standards. So with that said, that's something that we um, always have at the back of our mind. Now, when we looked at, do we use preferences to plan individual and group programs through the EPI tool? This was quite interesting. Still again, all over the board, just like level of functioning. Um, so about 60%, again, do use preferences when planning individual and group programming. Um, uh, a little more than 40%, maybe close to 50% of individuals um, use preferences 75% of the time. Um, less than 40% use it about 50% of the time and so on. So you can see we're kind of all over the board with this. Even though it's a CMS standard, we're still not all using it um, each time when we're planning our programming. So when we look at preferences, what are questions we should ask ourselves? And you might have some of these questions on your assessment. You know, what is their favorite food? What is their favorite um, pastime? What is their favorite movie, right? All those kinds of questions. What do they like and what do they dislike? Do they have sensory needs, which is very key in dementia care? Um, 
individuals with dementia are going to rely more on their senses as the disease progresses um, because that's a state of the, the kind of new world that they're in um, where they're going to rely more on the things that they see and hear and touch and taste and smell every day. They're going to rely more on that to navigate their world more than they're going to look back and, and kind of dig into some of that memory and use some of those um, past factual information to guide them. So the more that we know what sensory needs that they require, we're going to be better off in being able to provide that engagement. So um, what has worked well? What hasn't worked well? That's important for us to ask as well. So we can use these answers to create programs that will help connect them and that they can also feel respected, purposeful, satisfied, and engaged. Also, again, we can use these answers as preventative approaches to care and as ways to manage any negative behavioral expressions that are displayed, right? So it's not only helping us to use this information to build programs, but we can use them as preventative approaches and as interventions as needed. So I wanna go through a, just a quick example for an individual person, Joy, 85 years old, female resident with moderate dementia. She was assessed as having moderate functioning, uh, as a moderate functioning level. And her preferences include cooking, baking, painting, and spiritual activities, and tolerates small groups and one-on-one -on -one activities. So we're gonna go through these best practice approaches to talk about how to best use these with uh, an individual, uh, when we're talking about individual programming. So we're gonna look at where she falls. So she has moderate dementia in the functioning level. So the guide would be that we're going to um, meaningfully engage her 14 minutes a day, that we're going to look at um, you, uh, um, providing one-on-ones on a daily basis and small group activities with her preferences of cooking, baking, painting, and spiritual activities. Okay, so that's uh, that first step of using the level of functioning to plan programming, okay? Then what we look at is the, uh, oh, sorry, let me go back for a second. And then the uh, second best practice was what kinds of programs should she be engaged in? And we're identifying based on the chart that she should be getting one-on-ones and small group activities. And then the third best practice was identifying her preferences. And so we've done that as well. So how do we make this all happen, right? So the plan might read that she is again engaged at 14 minutes MRD with one-on-ones and group programming. So how can we uh, make this into real life, right? So her one-on-one -on -one engagement could be one time daily, like we had mentioned at five minute intervals with a focus on cooking, baking, painting, and spiritual activities. So this could be done with um, tactile things that you're doing with her. Um, like you could be mixing different kinds of ingredients for cooking and baking. Maybe you're painting with her uh, for the spiritual activities. Maybe you're uh, doing some one-on-one uh, -on -one Bible study with her, so on and so forth. And then for that small group activity, we're going to identify that she can, uh, uh, that at minimal, she'll be at one group, one small group daily at nine minutes. Now, if she stays for longer, then that's fantastic, right? But we're saying minimally, she would need to be there for nine minutes. And the groups that she might go to, let's say you have a group on your calendar, a small group called Bible study, maybe you have another one called Paint Me Happy, another one called Ingredients to Be. And so we would want to make sure that she is encouraged to go to these three specific groups because these identify with her preferences. It doesn't mean that she can't go to the other ones. It's just saying that these are more important because this is what's gonna match her preferences and make that small group engagement very meaningful. Um, and then from there, um, let's talk about group preferences. How do you start to develop then your calendar based? You've got all these individual plans. How do you make it more of a group effort? And so you can take a sample inventory of your residents' preferences. Um, and this is more so if you are um, still uh, on paper or you uh, track things on paper. I know it's harder to look at your, your whole census. So if you have 25 residents, take maybe a 30% sample, which would be about eight residents. And you can start to group individuals based on their preferences. So let's say 90% of your residents like art, then you definitely wanna have a large group activity on your calendar for art. But maybe let's say 10% of residents like sports. So you might wanna incorporate those into one-on-one -on -one activities with residents, or maybe a small group for those who just like sports. And that's how you apply that. Now, 
if you have the, uh, the opportunity to uh, be able to track electronically, uh, like Link Senior, um, Salo Engage, or Salo Context, um, they, th those two components together allow you to track programs, be able to run these kinds of reports so you can group individuals together. It's really fantastic because, again, that stuff, that, that data is right at your fingertips without having to do all this manually, too. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how we just level up. So we went over the three best practices, right? We went over level of functioning, uh, what kinds of programs, using preferences. Again, start to think about which one of those three do you want to, if you're not already doing those always, right? When we talk about the always 75% of the time, 50% of the time, if you're not doing those always, which one do you want to start creating a QAPI plan for? But with that said here, uh, I want to level up a little bit. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm going to push, push the envelope just a little bit here and talk about how we do need to um, use empirically validated approaches as well. There's really great information out there about what has been shown successful. So instead of reinventing the wheel, let's, let's use what's out there, right? Um, so basically when we talk about empirically validated approaches, this means using approaches uh, to care that have been studied and shown successful in working with individuals who have dementia. And if, you've been, if you're working with a different population, then maybe you look at evidence-based care for that particular population. Now in the EPI results here, um, we do show that, uh, again, only 15% of individuals always use the empirically validated approaches. So that's kind of a low number, and we want to see if we can push that. Maybe this is your QAPI. If you maybe do the other three very well, the best practices, maybe this is your QAPI, okay? And examples of um, some empirically validated approaches here in dementia care are David's Best Friends approach, uh, my approach, the Dementia Connection Model, uh, Cameron Camp's Montessori method. So some of these may be familiar to you and there's other ones out there too that are, that are excellent. And so with that, so I'm gonna hand it over to David he's gonna talk more about his empirically validated approach, the best friends approach. Thank you very much, Jennifer. And uh, I, I just pick up so much from your presentation about the importance of also just individual preferences. You know, I've written with my friend Virginia Bell that you've met one person with dementia. You kind of just met one person with dementia. Each is a unique individual with individual strengths. And I think it's wonderful that we're not trying to just do a one size fit all project. So just to share a bit about uh, my work with my dear friend Virginia Bell here a few years ago in Chicago. Uh, my friend Virginia Bell, who we've written for now for 30 years together, recently turned 99 years old and is still thriving and doing great in Lexington, Kentucky. Talk about old people are cool, Charles. Virginia definitely could be, uh, I think, your, uh, your uh, icon for that. We began our work in uh, day centers in the early 1980s, a time when there was still significant stigma about dementia. I remember back then working at the University of Kentucky, and people would often ask us to send the Alzheimer's brochures and pamphlets in an unmarked envelope with no return address because they didn't want the neighbors to know that they were coping with Alzheimer's. We've come a long way since then. So let me tell you a little bit more about the best friends approach and we'll give you a good, a good case study to kind of tie this whole webinar together. Thank you, Jen. Next, uh, Jennifer, next slide. So basically uh, the model of care we began working on in the 1980s, came out in the first book in the 1990s, uh, I think has really been very powerful in part because you know, we still don't have an effective medicine for Alzheimer's disease. I like to say that the treatment for Alzheimer's and other dementias is you and me. It's about engagement, socialization, activity, friendship, and relationships. And when you think about the lived experience of the person with Alzheimer's disease or the other dementias, that sense of loss and disconnection and fear and, 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 and frustration that can be there, uh, I think what the person really needs is a friend, a best friend. And, and what is friendship all about? It's about having empathy, walking a mile in the shoes of people living with dementia. This is such an important thing to train your staff about, about the power of empathy, and even with our family members to get them to understand this disease is real. Best friends and friends know each other well, and I was delighted to hear Jennifer's focus on knowing someone's life story. Uh, we want to know that maybe someone from Louisiana loves their hot sauce. They want their Tabasco sauce on their meatloaf. They might enjoy jazz, things like that. I'll just make a little side note, Jennifer, and everyone on the, on the webinar, that you know one thing that always amuses me is families will sometimes say, now, mother won't do this, mother's never done this, mother won't like that. 
Well, you know, things change with dementia. And sometimes I think people with dementia are actually easier to program for than others because they don't remember that they didn't do that. So you might have a high society lady who always enjoyed classical music and opera. And now she enjoys country Western and reruns of Hee Haw or something like that. So again, we wanna know and use their life story, but of course being very serious for a moment, it's powerful to know someone's preferences or spirituality, what they like, how they drink their coffee. Uh, maybe they've always loved um, you know, Christian music or country Western music. You wanna be sure to give them that opportunity. Friends talk a lot. They communicate, we text, we email, we phone. We wanna teach our staff and, and make sure our staff know how to communicate with affection and friendship and clarity. Friends support one another. And of course, all part of our work together, friends do things together, which is why activities are so essential in a memory care program. And of course, we creatively address challenges when it comes to challenging behaviors. And I think if you'll click the slide ahead once, Jennifer, what this all resolves down to or, or comes down to is something I write about in my books that I think probably all of you have on this webinar is that something Virginia and I talk about is caregiving knack. And the definition of the word knack is the art of doing difficult things with ease or clever strategies. So having that, that patience, that flexibility, you know, how do you get someone to come to an activity? Well, you ask three times in different ways. You, you ask them to help you do something. Hey, come with me, I could sure use your help instead of saying now it's time for exercise class. So again, this idea of having this finesse and knack and working with people with dementia. Next slide, Jennifer. So as part of my case study, one thing Virginia Bell and I have done for many, many years now is we've been very blessed to actually, when we tell a story, when, when we write about people with dementia, we actually in our books tell real stories where we actually use real people's names and we tell their hometowns. We get all the permissions from the person with dementia and their family members, because we like to feel that telling a story with an actual name behind it honors someone's memory, it fights stigma, and of course it also keeps us uh, more, more uh, accountable and that we're telling real stories. So here's a, a dear friend of mine from the past, Daphne Bormley, Santa Barbara. I, I worked in Santa Barbara for 10 years with the Alzheimer's Association. And Daphne was quite an extraordinary person. Next slide, Jennifer. Daphne was a scientist, an optician who worked on the Hubble Space Telescope. She had quite an extraordinary background. Next slide. And Daphne, uh, in this very highly technical profession, began making subtle mistakes at work. After all, you know, if you're a scientist or an engineer or a bridge builder, or in this case, someone working on a space project, your colleagues, everything has to be spot on. You can't just simply make subtle mistakes. So when her colleagues expressed concern, she received a thorough workup by a neurologist. And actually, sadly, she was confirmed to have Alzheimer's disease uh, what we now call younger onset at the age of 59, and, and kind of in some ways walked out the door, forced into early retirement, leaving behind a beloved job. But Daphne was quite extraordinary. extraordinary. Despite her losses, she remained physically active, intellectually curious, aware of her life story, and interested in the arts and being creative. In fact, she said to me, Jennifer, that art really was very, very healing for her. She'd always loved art but had really left it behind with her family and her career or all of that. But when she got Alzheimer's, she found that art was very therapeutic. She wanted to do it. It made her feel like she could still accomplish things. And so let me show you a couple of her pieces I think will be quite amazing for many of you to see. Next slide. Here's perhaps my favorite. She lived again in Santa Barbara. Uh, and so we're on the coast in California. And here she painted a lighthouse. On the left, she said, David, is me before Alzheimer's. On the right is me after. And I think we could, if we were all together in a big room, we could probably take a half an hour and debate this. But I, I think it's just an extraordinary piece. Again, on the left, David, me before Alzheimer's. On the right, me after. And, and I think in so many ways, you could, you could you know, spend, again, we could all be art critics. But to me, I think it means that she wanted to be more playful, more engaged. She said, David, my spice rack used to be alphabetized. And now, of course, I think she's letting go of her past sort of, you know, perfectionism and trying to be more in the moment. She meant this painting to be humorous. Next slide. I thought you might also enjoy this picture she did of Catholic saints. Uh, uh, Daphne had been raised in the Catholic church, but had, had left the religion. You know, she would tell you she was a woman of science. But again, later in her dementia, she began painting these amazing pictures of Catholic saints, 
which again reminds me that someone in this case who hadn't been religious now is turning to religious art. Uh, we could again discuss this for many hours, but I think in this case, it was her quest for meaning, maybe the fact that she was somewhat rolling back into the past, but just lovely, lovely pieces. So let's go to the next slide and we'll try to, I know our time is very short, but maybe in the chat room, we can all just throw a few ideas out there. You know, you've met Daphne, she's younger onset, she's active, she walks uh, regularly, she exercises, she's communicative, um, she's had this background in arts and science. Uh, what would you, what kind of plan, what do you think she would enjoy if she moved into your residential program tomorrow, if she was in your day center or you were caring for her at home? Let's just throw up a few ideas in the chat box. Uh, anything you can think of, how, what would Daphne, what would be meaningful programming for her? Meaningful programming. And let's just take one minute and open up the chat box or just you know, feel free to share any ideas you'd have for this extraordinary woman if she was in your program. Give her a room with a view, science programs, art, keeping her busy and active in arts and crafts, leading a painting group, teaching others, wonderful. Getting her a telescope, Jenna, excellent. Discussion group, painting classes, <laughs> you all are too fast. Art with music, of course we know music is therapy. Oh my goodness, lots and lots of great ideas. Why am I not surprised that this is a very talented group? Yeah, you know, I think in so many ways, council president performing, art for sure, applied sciences, books on sciences, excellent, Patricia. You know, maybe get some books from the library. Uh, you can imagine National Geographic specials on television. I think she might even enjoy old schlocky episodes of Star Trek or perhaps going out at night and looking up to the stars. All of these can be very important. Well, thank you all. I hate to shut down this incredible discussion, but I better get through the rest of my slides or I'll be in trouble with Charles. Next slide, uh, thank you very much, Jennifer. Here are just a few ideas I have. Again, I think you've caught all of them, but you could use something like Link Senior or other internet sources to explore topics of interest, trivia about astronomy, watching old science fiction movies, TV shows, enjoying images from the Hubble telescope, reading science magazine, discussing arts, visit museums, taking online classes about painting, and exploring trivia about various places Daphne has been or has lived. Again, uh, what saddens me, and I'll be very, very serious for a moment, you know, I think we do drop the ball. We don't always have the life story information ahead of a move-in. And imagine someone like Daphne moving in on a Friday afternoon and the staff know nothing about her. So be sure that those social history preferences, those plans are made well in advance of a, of a move-in. It can be very, very powerful. And of course, if you engage Daphne in the right way, everything goes better. Next slide. Thank you, Jennifer. So as we wind this down, I, I guess I'll just reflect that I think in so many ways, the brain loves company. I think boredom is the enemy. And in the best friend's philosophy, we, we very much focus on engagement and activity. There's so many important things we can do. And the benefits of this are so evidence-based. There's such a great evidence backdrop for music, exercise. Uh, if you Google someone named Dr. Bruce Miller, his work with frontal temporal patients in San Francisco about how they very much get a spike in creativity earlier in the disease. There's so much we can say, but Jennifer and I wanted to kind of leave you with just kind of our quick and dirty list, so to speak, of things to do as we are still in the COVID crisis. Music, music, music. We know that song lyrics and music live in a different part of the brain than words and language. Be sure to get those Google speakers or Alexa speakers. Uh, move that, move that, you know, do much, everything you can to get music going. I'm a huge fan of collage because it's tactile. Uh, I think it goes for all stages of dementia. You can paint, draw, press. You can plan a topic, plan a theme. Being outdoors, even on a chilly day, gives you natural vitamin D. It's sensory, it's spiritual. I'm a big fan of creating weekly rituals and teas, English tea parties, books, reading club, doing something for others. I think, Jennifer, that very much meets your um, definition of meaningful engagement. One of my favorites is to bake dog biscuits for local animal shelter. Uh, creating some top 10 life story cards to inspire individualized activities. I saw my friends from Prestige Senior Living. I'll do a shout out to them on the call today. And they do a lot of innovative work with life stories. Um, survey staff to identify their talents, put them on the calendar. Weekly themes, a volunteer family program committee to help you devise, devise themes. I think that adult learning is so powerful. I want you to really push as even if the person 30 minutes later forgets you've talked about the history of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco or talked about Chicago. In the moment, 
they enjoy the experience of learning. And of course, one little tip here again, kind of in COVID crisis with budgets being hit, you know, as a sometimes even for-profit provider, you can't ask your families to certainly donate cleaning supplies, but I think it's very appropriate to ask families to donate for collage supplies. Maybe you wanna do an English tea party, write your families and ask them if they have any bone china teacups from grandmother's collections or teapots that are gathering dust at home and see if they'll donate them to your program. We'll move on to our last couple of slides here, Jennifer. Well, okay, forgive me, I guess I'll plug my own books for one moment. Uh, Virginia Bell and I have written a series of books on the best friends approach. I want you to particularly know about our activity books, volume one and volume two, and we'll put it in the chat box, but my publisher, Health Professions Press, very kindly is giving participants a discount if you order from them in the next few weeks. And so that will be in the chat box, the link to get those discounts. They're also, of course, available on, on Amazon and other places as well. Next slide. Jennifer, yes, I will let you plug uh, or promote your own book, I should say. But uh, as we wind down, I know our time is running short. I just want to simply say that Jennifer and Charles, thank you for the great work you're doing. I'm at a community today in Illinois that uses Link Senior and was already you know, seeing how, how valuable it can be. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. And I'll look forward to uh, being with you again on future webinars. Thank you. Thank you, David, appreciate it. So yeah, we definitely wanna share these resources. So here, as uh, David had mentioned, are his, um, his work that he's done with Virginia Bell. And then here's another resource as well. When we talk about evidence-based approaches, um, the dementia connection models featured in the Busy Caregiver's Guide to Advance Alzheimer's Disease. And what's just great about this book is it's a workbook style. So the caregiver, whether you're a staff member, you're a family member, you can take notes along the way to see which tools is what I talk about that are helpful for the person that you are working with. And so you're kind of building the plan of care as you go throughout the book, which is wonderful. And this is available at Johns Hopkins Press, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, or my website, neuroessence.org backslash shop in our wellness tool shop, we'll get a signed copy. So it's pretty exciting. So in conclusion, um, when we utilize the process of API to enforce this concept of social prescription, we can really be effective in the way that we're engaging residents and producing quality clinical outcomes. The planning process can be complicated, we understand that, but there's some best practices to get you started, right? And so we talked about that level of functioning is important, knowing what programs to engage them with, as well as upholding their preferences. And of course, to level up your programming using those empirically validated approaches as much as possible. And then you're ready to implement your programs. So with that said, we wanna thank you so much for today. And we'll go to, do we have time, Charles, for any questions? We're past the time, but if you unshare your screen, I would be uh, more than happy to share your contacts. Okay. information and so and just that one people... quick thing too yeah. um megan if you can just put in the chat box this um this is a follow-up to the epi tool real fast it is basically to understand if you had the opportunity to take the epi tool i know many of you on this webinar have um please take this follow-up survey it's less than five minutes very brief we just want to know what your satisfaction is with the epi tool and so um, Megan will put in the chat box, the link that you see here at the bottom so that we can easily access that. We um, know that you're very busy, but thank you. If you can do that follow-up survey, that'd be fantastic. Okay, I'm done now, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No, um, thank you both. As, as always, amazing presentation. Uh, David, I, I love what you say when you say uh, brain loves company. I think it's true for all of us, humankind, right? Like we're all, quote unquote, social, uh, social animals. So as I shared with uh, Jen, uh, please feel free to get in touch with our amazing speakers. I loved, David and Jen, your tie back with the art because I feel it kind of uh, tied back so well with our first presentation. So all of the um, uh, audience members, please feel free to reach out should you have any questions to Jen and David. Um, the presentation deck will be made available, actually are made available, and Megan has already shared it a number of times, the links, uh, but we'll send that to you by email. David, Jen, thank you so much, and uh, look forward to, uh, to seeing you soon.